I'd like to uh, open the October 29th meeting of the Wakefield Conservation Commission. Um, first up, we'll take uh, attendance. Ken. Here. Jimmy. Here. Teresa. Here. I know Frank cannot make it. Uh, Peter, I do not see Peter yet. Uh, I don't know if Peter can make it either, actually. Well, we'll get right into it. So the uh, only item on the agenda tonight is a seminar. It's a uh, light pollution presentation. Uh, Jane Slade from Spec Lines Outdoor Lighting will be presenting uh, to us. Uh, we'll hold any questions until you know the end or when Jane feels it's appropriate to ask. Um, Jane, are you there? Hi there. Hello, Jane. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to share this information. I Thank love you for joining us. <laughs> yes. um, you, oh, Sylvan is here now also, for the record. Uh, Jane, take it away whenever you'd like. Uh, you have permission to share. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'll just uh, quickly introduce myself. My name is Jane Slade. I work at Spec Lines. I actually have our co-founder on the call as well, Paul Meller. And so we are a lighting representative agency, meaning that we rep manufacturers and we bring the, that lighting into projects and have done so for the last 30 years in New England. So you may know projects that we've done in Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, um, and all of New England. Um, I can share that information at a later time. Um, but we do lighting, we have an office in Wakefield. And so we are very interested in trying to bring the most um, environmentally friendly solutions to uh, projects today. So with that, I will share my screen for this presentation. Um, let me just find that right button here. And here we are. Okay. Now, are you guys looking at the presenter view or the um, regular view? So, presenter. You, okay, I'll just switch those. Hold on. Now, how does it look? Perfect. Awesome. Great. So, uh, essentially today we are going to go through how light impacts wildlife and essentially more than any other factor, temperature changes year over year. You have El Nino in small terms, you have ice ages in long terms of time, but light has been the same up until the industrial revolution. And so that is a big change in our environment that's not that's being underestimated in its impact. And so we'll look at exterior lighting conditions that can be harmful to wildlife and then projects and case studies that have caused harm. We'll also look at existing regulations and this will be really interesting for um, from a town's perspective of what can be done. And then we'll look at really positive case studies that have affected change. So what is light pollution? Well, it's really any unwanted light, and that can come in the form of light trespass, glare, sky glow. And so we actually have natural phenomenon, a phenomena of sky glow, which is the moon. And you know, you'll notice that animals and wildlife will behave differently around a full moon. And in fact, predator and prey have a whole relationship where if it's really bright, prey will hide. We also have human-made sky glow. And uh, this, I have another image of Hong Kong, this is Hong Kong, at the end of the presentation, which shows an even worser uh, version of sky glow, but you cannot see a single star here. And so we are really brightening up this nighttime sky, which is really a map for animals. And you could read by this light. So the question is, how much light is enough? And so 
we also have issues with glare. So if you've ever left the movie theater for a matinee and you get out to the parking lot and you start squinting, that's your eye adapting from a dark light level to a really light light level. Now we can see at really low light levels and really high light levels, but not at the same time. Your eyes have to adjust. It takes about one minute to adjust from dark to light. It takes an hour to adjust from light to dark. And so this is a really famous study that had happened actually. Um, birds were flying and this is 9-11, the 9-11 Memorial, a tribute to light in New York. And this is incidentally turned on at a peak migration period. So birds were getting trapped in these vortices of light. They could not see their way out. Observers could actually hear birds squawking uh, at ground level. And the New York City Audubon actually developed a relationship with facilities to intermittently turn these lights out. And actually it turned out that the birds were just fine once we let them loose. So, uh, but many were dying of exhaustion if we hadn't. And what this really um, predicts is that more than any other solution, lighting controls are going to be the solution. And if you think about the term lighting controls, it really implies we're not in control of our lighting. And that's absolutely true. We really need to gain control in terms of a more global um, control of our lighting. And then another issue that we have, and this affects humans too. Also, I can't really see you, but if you had a question, you would be welcome to ask me. This can be interactive. Um, so another issue is clutter, which is that light is everywhere. And I don't know if you guys have this problem, but my living room blinks from my router, from my TV and all these things. And it's like, nothing's ever really fully dark anymore. And intuitively, we know that that's a brake light and that's a street light, but to an animal or a plant, this is truly garble. It means nothing. And so one of the biggest issues is awareness and that most people don't understand how light pollution works. And one of the issues is that the air is only seemingly invisible and actually it's filled with soft particulate and dust so that when we shine light up through the air, it creates clouds of light that obstruct the natural cycle of darkness. It's estimated that one single light fixture has the ability to cause light pollution up to 120 miles away. And this is coming from the model lighting ordinance, which I will get to later. This is a very important document for towns. And that's absolutely true. If you look at the photographs of the earth, this is where we're at. And coming up on the United States, you can see the grid lines of the West, the Midwest. We can see Chicago, we can see Boston, we can see Northampton. And so when you take into account the re-reflections of light, this is the scientific model. Uh, so this is the photograph, but this is the scientific model taking into account the clouds of light in the, in the dust of the air. And it's estimated that eight out of 10 school children do not see the night sky as it is. And so we, when we talk about dark skies, Often the conversation stops where the human loss is, which is that we don't get that time of nostalgia and reflection looking up at the stars. And it's super important, yes, but I will tell you that there's something way more urgent happening and that's how we're impacting wildlife. And so this is a term, it's called solastalgia. It was coined by Glenn Albrecht, he's a philosopher, and it was basically to talk about the psychic stress that we feel. But honestly, we're, we're deeply impacting the rhythm of our environment when we keep the lights on at night. And so what are the impacts? Well, firstly, the sky was our first screen. It gave us an enormous amount of data, whether it was the time of day, the season, our location on the planet, our trajectory, the weather. There was so much information. If you've ever heard that expression, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning, that was information we gleaned from the sky. And the other impact is that we have circadian rhythms. So our skin is photosensitive. We have special receptors in our eyes that are just for, uh, that are not for seeing. They're actually tied to our master clock in our head. So. Um, the light really impacts the rhythm of our days. Um, and so that's the same for all plants and all animals and no species is gonna be the same. So it will affect each species differently. And so essentially the delicate balance of interspecies interaction is upset 
when we extend daylight. And so we all have hormones. So for instance, humans, we have serotonin. When light levels fall, we convert this to melatonin. But interestingly, for long, for nocturnal animals, melatonin also is what they call the hormone of darkness. It comes when the darkness comes, but it's part of their wakefulness physiology. So it impacts them differently. And so how does exterior lighting affect wildlife? Well, quick show of hands and I can see a few of you, but how many of you have heard of the sea turtle problem? Mm -hmm. Right. So here's, here's my issue. I think the little buggers are cute, but uh, it's the only animal pretty much anyone talks about. And actually it's really adorable and cute and it dies on beaches, it's easy to care, but no one talks about dung beetles and I will talk about dung beetles today. And that's just an example of an insect that is impacted. And that is just to say that every animal is tied to light and every plant is tied to light. So all animals, not just humans, depend on a regular interval of daylight and proper functioning uh, for behavioral, reproductive, and immune systems. And so when we think about, we have this interconnected network of beings, all of these relationships were nudged into place over eons. And when we shine light, we sort of start to play with these relationships and that's gonna have a huge impact on biodiversity and interdependence. So we think of, you know, we're diurnal, we're active during the day, but actually 70% of mammals are nocturnal 90% of amphibians are nocturnal. Um, there's even studies that are showing that animals are behaving more nocturnally to avoid humans. So many species are actually really active at night. Um, and as I have said before, hormones and as well as photoreceptors, they behave differently in every animal body and every plant body. So there's no, no one universal solution other than to continue to keep the natural cycle of daylight and darkness in place. And so what are the direct effects of light pollution? Well, to name a few, it disorients and distracts animals. It triggers reproductive behaviors at the wrong periods. It frustrates behaviors around feeding and pollination. And it also alters migration. And that is a short list of what is actually a very long list. Um, and so what are the impacts? Well, I'm gonna go through a few sets of species. For insects, I'll say, I'll go through fireflies, bees, monarch butterflies, and dung beetles. For mammals, I'll do bats and whales. For birds, um, I'll talk about birds in general, and then we'll talk about zooplankton to give you an, an uh, example of tiny species that are impacted. And then finally, we'll talk about trees as an example of plants. So. E.O. Wilson at Harvard, he said that if mankind were to disappear, the world would re regenerate uh, very quickly. Uh, but if insects were to vanish, then we would not be okay. It would just, the environment would collapse. And to illustrate that point, at any given time, there are 10 quintillion insects alive. That's a one with 19 zeros after it. If you average out that each insect weighs that of an ant, that's three milligrams. Insects still outweigh us 70 to one. They are a biomass on the planet. We absolutely need insects. And so fireflies are interesting because they actually are a, an insect that utilizes light. They use an enzyme called luciferase in their uh, abdomen. And so they use that actually to interact uh, at all stages of life. So as larvae, they'll glow and this wards off predators. And then when they are attracting a mate, it's a language of love. And then when they are um, together, they will also flash to warn of predators. And so actually there are 2000 different species there on every single continent except Antarctica. And one study showed that in the presence of light, actually there was a 50% decrease in firefly flashes. And I, when I give this presentation live, I always ask the audience how many people see less fireflies and the answer is frequently yes. And so pollination is a huge problem that we talk about just in general outside of light pollution. We've noticed that there's a reduction of pollinators on the planet and there's a reduction of pollination. And pollination is absolutely vital to human being survival as well as just in general planetary health. So the most common pollinators are bees, wasps, moths, 
butterflies, flies, and beetles. And when we talk about bees, they are a genius species. They are social genius. They they divide into many different tasks. They'll have water collecting bees, nectar collecting bees. I've even heard recently someone told me that bees have been known to fall asleep in a flower. I mean, that's pretty adorable, but I'm just saying these creatures have their own personalities and they are deeply impacted by light. So they have very complex social behaviors. They dance to communicate. Um, they are mostly diurnal, but some are nocturnal. And interestingly, we need both types of pollinators, diurnal and nocturnal, to do the ecological service of pollination. Um, and just like people, bees also sleep. And what's interesting is that if we are drawing these animals out of the hive at inopportune times, because we're saying the light is one thing when it's really another, um, bees actually have very sensitive wing mechanisms. Should they hit a snap of cold, their wings actually lock up and they fall right to the ground. It's very dangerous to be tricking bees with the wrong light at night uh, for all of the reasons I'm saying. It's a very sensitive creature. Albert Einstein said, if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then man would have only four years of life left to live. No more bees, no more pollination, no more man. Monarch butterfly is another pollinator. Um, what's so interesting about this species, now we, you've probably heard that they're in decline partly because their food source is in decline, um, which may also be related to light pollution. But this is an interesting species because this species migrates from parts of North America and Canada, Northeast and, um, and a little bit in the Midwest, all the way down to a very specific place in Mexico. It looks like a carpet of monarch butterflies because they return to this one place. And what's interesting is that it's not the one butterfly that makes it, it's the great, 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 great grandchildren. So the, it's over generations, meaning that they are hardwired to make this journey. And these animals require multiple mechanisms to get there, including geomagnetic forces, as well as a map of the stars, moon, and the sun. And so we are noticing that we are seeing less monarch butterflies. So one potential issue is certainly light pollution. Um, because when we are drawing these animals off course because of faux constellations of cities or because they can't see the stars at all, we take these tiny little invertebrates and we really put them in a vulnerable position. So in terms of pollination, um, we actually have a study and they took a lit meadow and they compared it to an unlit meadow and the lit meadow received 62% less visits. It also had 29% fewer pollinating insects and it also bore 13% less fruits. And what makes this more complex is that oftentimes pollinators are pollinating their own food sources. So it becomes a vicious cycle. Ah, the promised dung beetle. So um, they took dung beetles and they put them in a planetarium and they wanted to know if they astro navigated. And when the planetarium star lights were on, the beetles moved in straight, narrow paths. When they turned the lights off, they started to scatter into random movement. And so what is that? What that is to say is that a tiny organism is actually utilizing the map of the stars to find its way on the planet. Mammals are interesting. As I said before, they will follow the predator-prey relationship with the cycle of the moon. So when, oh, I see there's a question. Hold on. Um, I, okay, that is not quite a question. Okay. So both predator and prey, they are, they cycle around the moonlight. So prey will hide, predator will have to hunt harder. And when we shine light all the time, we start to really play with this cycle of moonlight. Um, and then the other thing is we've been very numb to actually the um, striking of animals on the road, but light can draw animals to the road. And so that's just something that can be considered with the dawning of lighting controls, which is how much light do we need and when do we need it on? And so bats are also a mammal. And what's interesting is that there are, I just learned, I was corrected, there are 1,400 species, 1,400 known species of bats. They're super important in the, um, in the environment because they actually eat the 10 quintillion insects. They govern the insects. 
And so um, all species are nocturnal and they are the only flying mammal. Now, if you wanna have one source, I recommend this source that I'm citing, the ecological consequences of artificial night lighting. Warning, you will not curl up with this book. It is a dry compilation of scientific articles, but it is really the source on this topic. And essentially the habit of feeding at artificial lights is now so common and widespread among bats that it must be considered the normal life habit of many species. So we're changing the behavior of bats. And I'd like to back up for a second, which is that we are drawing the nocturnal pollinator away from the cabbage thistle, which is now bearing less fruit. That nocturnal pollinator is hanging out at the street light, which is now either dying of exhaustion, and you can read about that in an article in the New York Times entitled The Insect Apocalypse, or it's being eaten by the bat who is not doing what it normally would have been doing. And so this is all to say that we're not just changing any one species, we're changing the relationships between the species that have been nudged into place over eons. And this delicate balance is just, we won't really know what we're doing until it's perhaps too late. Whales uh, also astro-navigate, so they actually tagged whales and they will navigate thousands of miles, sometimes as much as 5,000 miles in a single leg. They actually breed at the tropics and then they feed at the poles. So um, they will, will navigate through very turbulent open water. And so they tagged a set of humpback whales. And what they found was that they navigated always within five degrees and often within one. And so how are they doing this? Well. The thing is, is that if you've ever used a compass, yes, they do actually have uh, geomagnetic forces. They, are, they will respond to it, but it's not consistent across the, the face of the planet. So they have to be also utilizing a view of the moon and the stars to be able to navigate so very precisely. I will also point out that whales are communicators and they will sing um, songs between one another, and, but you still need a leader of the pack on an aside, there are other studies showing that whale tones have gone up in general to avoid the low tones of motors of boats. So we are really impacting how they communicate and relate to the earth. In terms of species, there's no species that is more impacted directly by light pollution than birds. So it's estimated that up to 1 billion birds die due to fatal flight into buildings each year in North America. And um, basically we distract them and disorient them with, with lights on the ground. And we also blanch the night sky so they can't see the map. Um, there are awareness programs. This is out of Canada. It's called FLAP, Fatal Light Awareness Program. This is an installation showing the birds that were killed. Those are real life birds that died. Where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the animal control person says that his main role is actually collecting dead birds. And so uh, not only is there fatal flight, but also we change how birds molt, we change how they reproduce because we impact their circadian rhythms as well. So it's a really uh, impacting on all levels for this species. And then I wanted to talk about zooplankton. So zooplankton are tiny little floating species in water. And they are very exquisitely sensitive to light. And so what they'll do is they actually hang out in the depths of the water during the day. This helps them to avoid UV light and predators. And then during um, dusk, they actually vertically navigate upward and that's when they'll eat algae. And what, they've, what they will say is that when light is present, they won't vertically navigate. And that can have a huge impact on aquatic ecosystems because that can in involve e um, algae blooms. And then I'll also point out that whales at the top of the ecosystem, zooplankton at the bottom, are both impacted by light pollution. So there you have it. Getting to plants, we have trees. Uh, just as an example, um, I will say plants are producers. They take extraterrestrial sun energy. They convert it into building blocks for humans. So we are consumers. Without plants, there are no humans. So plants photosynthesize this light 
and it's information for them as well as fuel. So plants specifically, trees, are very impacted by photo period. And this is basically the length of daylight. So we are losing daylight now up until December 21st. <clears throat> and that will tell the trees to um, lose the tree, to lose their leaves, to start to, develop, to prepare for dormancy for winter. Um, in the spring, they'll start to um, have their flowering patterns uh, come back. So the tree is really dependent on the length of daylight. However, when we extend the length of daylight, this can be a really big issue. So um, what I'll just say is that plants are the lungs of our earth. They're the reverse of our own CO2, O2 process. So we really have no idea what will happen when we are letting these changes cascade out into the ecosystem. So what can be done? Well, um, so I had promised to talk about this. This is the model lighting ordinance. This was a collaboration between the, the Illuminating Engineering Society. So if you want to know how much light to put on a horseshoe court or a horse track or a highway, I mean, I'm trying to give you all the different weird examples that they do have recommendations for. Basically, the Illuminating Engineering Society is the authority for lighting recommendations in the entire world. So they have every single recommendation you could think of. Um, incidentally, horses, very scared of shadows. So if you shine light onto a horse track and there's shadows, you will spook the horses. It's a big part of that recommendation. Um, the International Dark Sky Association is, they're based uh, in the, um, I believe they're in Tucson, I could be wrong, but they're in the West and um, I'll show you coming up uh, how dark the West is due, partly due to their advocacy. Um, but they partnered with the Illuminating Engineering Society to come up with a model lighting ordinance in that most of the time, people that are making up lighting regulations, they actually aren't really knowing what the best moves are. So the model lighting ordinance was developed to give people a starting place of language to bring into their own legislation for their own towns. And so how it works is that it's organized into different lighting zones. So you could, you could go around and say, okay, well, where's Wakefield measuring in at? Where, where do we want to be in our lighting levels? How they organized it is lighting zone zero is like Yellowstone National Park. You really don't want any permanent lighting. Lighting zone one is say a rural town. Lighting zone two is probably Wakefield where you have a lot of um, activity, nighttime needs, et cetera. And then lighting zone three is probably Boston. Uh, now lighting zone four is not a default zone. It's not a recommended zone. It just happens to exist. This is Times Square. I recently learned this fun fact, Las Vegas is the brightest city on earth. Um, this is not considered a recommendation by anyone in the lighting industry. It might have its benefits for fun and entertainment, but it is not considered environmentally sound. And so um, when you do utilize the lighting ordinance, um, you can use different methods to get to this model. Um, but what I will say is you want to have a lighting expert um, because there's just a lot of uh, twists and turns along the way and you want to make sure that you make the right decisions in the development of your own ordinance so that you achieve your results. Um, there are challenges and that is that it's not always adopted because it can be more complicated and that's why you do need the expert. Um, and so if you want to get the results, you really want to bring in a lighting expert. And so a lot of times people just don't understand um, that lighting can be a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, so honestly, you really just want to help build awareness. And then lastly, that can help build consensus. And so when we look at different towns that have achieved light, good light levels, and I'll just quickly show you this map. If you look, Maine, that dark part of Maine on the upper right hand side of the map, that's the Bar, Har Bar Harbor area. And then on the left side, Arizona area, that's, you see how dark that side of the map is. That's, that's largely due to advocacy that we're seeing. So Bar Harbor, Maine got, was very, very successful in becoming a dark sky place. And then we also have Sky Village in Arizona. It's considered the darkest place in the Northwest, in the Southwest. So what can we do? In terms of designing for wildlife, utilizing controls, 
this is going to be the best thing that we can do to light for both human activity, which we need human act. We need lighting for safety. We need it for sports. We need it for driving. We need it for crime. It is absolutely inescapable that light needs to be shown at night, but with controls, you can turn them off. You can turn them down. You can get it just right. Um, we can avoid triggering wavelengths. So the early age of LEDs was a very bluish triggering light. We now can bring lights down to a warmer light level. I will warn you that there's no perfect light, as in red light is more ideal for sea turtles, but actually it's very triggering for, um, for birds. And then utilizing window coverings that can be also really helpful in terms of avoiding fatal flight into windows. For birds, um, birds actually migrate uh, during certain times. And so actually we can start utilizing controls to rapidly experiment. Maybe we change how we control our lights during September and March. Um, we can also take special design precaution with buildings 300 feet or below. That's actually where we see the most fatal flight. New York City just passed a whole um, regulation that the first 75 feet of buildings have to address bird-friendly um, designs with bird-friendly <coughs> And then with birds specifically, green and blue are more ideal, red and white are not. And so I would just caution that you really want to try and keep things dark and not necessarily rely on a wavelength. Um, and so, you know, here we are, we're on this webinar and thank you so much. I, it's a pleasure to share all of this information with you all. Um, what I always say is, you know, when we talk about wildlife and, and the environment and green design, a lot of times these terms, they don't mean anything to anyone anymore because we've heard them all too many times. And so I would um, urge you to actually bring in a specific species to talk about because people won't turn their back on a specific species. So yes, I'm also showing you really cute animals deliberately. Um, but what I'll say is, you know, bring in a species in Wakefield that you know of that's there and, how, and talk about how it's impacted. It's a great way to just develop advocacy, um, but don't get too specific because as I've been saying, you know, if you'd over design, you'll get, you'll get unintended consequences for other species. And so well, let's look at a couple case studies. Flagstaff, Arizona was um, one of a very successful place in terms of uh, designing their lighting to meet their needs. This wasn't an accident. They actually started in 1958. And so in 2001, they were named the first international dark sky place. And how they did this is actually one thing they did is they did not adopt LED lighting. And that's not my recommendation because LEDs have come a long way. But one of the secret benefits of some of the older light sources, such as high pressure and low pressure sodium, this very yellow light. I don't know if anyone remembers going over the Bourne Bridge, but that was those were, those original lights were very yellow, and so they actually don't render much color, meaning that they never really did trigger wildlife. So they were able to really reduce their light emissions by not going with the more high powered LEDs, which are energy saving. But uh, nowadays we can actually create light color in LEDs to be less triggering. So we can get the best of both worlds. But this is how Flagstaff approached it. And because of their approach, they actually reduced uh, their light emissions by eight times. And they were 14 times more dim and their radius was eight times smaller. Uh, Big Park, Arizona is another one of the places. So in the West, there's a really burgeoning area. And quite frankly, if, if you want to see the stars at this point, you have to go to Maine or the West. Um, that's really where we've really lost the stars in Massachusetts and, and most of New England. Um, and so the densest area of IDA dark sky, dark sky places is in the West. Getting into the final part of the presentation, awareness and best practices. So the Bortle scale is a scale, it was developed by John Bortle, an astronomer. And this was just to kind of look at where we are. So you can actually judge where, what your level is. I'm in Cambridge, which is really Boston. I bet I'm a, probably at a seven or an eight. There's very few ones left in the United States. And so, um, yeah, we're really losing our night. And so this was a citizen science project where you can actually log your own 
uh, vis view of the night sky. I would actually take you to this website, which is lightpollutionmap.info. That is a satellite image of, um, it's an aggregate of many satellites that show us the light pollution. So it's lightpollutionmap.info. And you can see exactly what's happening right where you are. And so um, this really, this citizen science project actually is just so people create awareness because here's the deal. Uh, most people just don't know. They're not monsters. They just don't know that light pollution is a huge trigger for wildlife. And what's funny is we can solve it. So the best prescriptions, so designing for specific applications. And so if I'm just quickly showing you some different applications. We have a rural road, which quite frankly can rely on the, the light of the headlights. Then we have a small town with low buildings and more narrow streets. And then we have a really big city street, higher buildings, wider streets. These are all tremendously different light applications which require different light power, different light um, locations, et cetera. So, so there's no one solution, everything is unique. And so you wanna conduct photometric studies, which means that you wanna measure how much existing light there is. And then you also wanna use computer software. And this is where you really wanna have a lighting expert because an LED might look really small, it could be a glare bomb. And you don't really know what the result will be until you use the computer software so that you get the aggregate of all lights in the direction that they're pointing. And then providing the right amount of light, not more, not less. So this is an image that I just wanted to say, which is you really want to do your five W's. Who, what, where, when, why. So who's getting this light? And uh, where is this light going? So is this second floor, is that a residence? And is that light going into that residence? When is this light being shown? And why is it being shown? Is it for crime? So all of these are questions that you really wanna know ahead of time to get the light exactly how you want it. And then using dark sky compliant fixtures and shielding. So this, these are all dark sky compliant fixtures. So if you look at that middle one at the top, the light source is in that lid, in that hat, and it's only shining downward. So dark sky compliant fixtures, basically their light source is horizontal to the plane of the earth. So there's no vertical, um, there's no shielding that allows the light to spill out uh, in all directions. So these are all examples of dark sky compliant lighting. And what's great is you can still bring in that historical look and you don't necessarily have to lose that now that we have the lighting technology. And then utilizing warmer color light. So what does that really look like? So on the left, you see really warm light. On the right, you see really bluish light. Now LEDs, they tend to veer blue, but you can specify them to be warmer, like the left side. And here's my rule of, of thumb for the entire presentation, which is that we wanna be mimicking the natural daylight cycle as much as possible. And of course we wanna light for human activity and safety, but we can do that best with choosing the right color temperatures and utilizing controls. So the natural daylight cycle looks like this. It's really warm at sunset. It's really cool at the zenith at, at noon. It's really warm again at sun, sunrise, sorry, sunrise, noon, sunset. It gets warm again during the sun set, and then it's really dark. So you want to emulate that as much as possible. And we truly have that ability with lighting controls and specifying the right types of lighting. And so lighting controls really allow us to assess what does a town need, when does the town need it. And so we actually can control down to a single light fixture now. It's amazing. My cat is joining for the meeting. That's Ferdinand. So I knew he always makes an appearance. So controls will really be our get out of jail free card for lighting pollution because we can now only use the light that we need. And then avoiding uplighting as always. And so I had shown you that picture of Hong Kong at the beginning of the presentation. And this is Hong Kong when we have cloud coverage. 
So this is even harder for wildlife to see the night sky or to make their way through this fog. So we are really creating a lot of light pollution and that is generally not even taking into account inclement weather. So honestly, it's really important that we find a way to come to a consensus. And what I'll say is that the earth has never been brighter and we've never been more scared of the dark. And so we really need to create awareness so that we can scale back how much light we're using at all times of night. And so my call to action is to utilize controls to turn lights out from midnight to 6 a.m. And that will give an enormous respite to wildlife. And if you see this Boston skyline, does the John Hancock and the Prudential Center need to be on at all times? It doesn't. Turning lights out using window coverings could bring an enormous respite to wildlife. And so if I just want to point something out, which is that if the power were to go out right now, light pollution would go away in the snap of my finger. And there's no other type of pollution that is like that. If you look at the global warming or CO2 emissions or plastic in the oceans, it's going to be enormously difficult to solve that. But we actually have lighting controls right now where we can control a single fixture in a city. So we have the ability to bring this back into balance and find a more balanced way of being in combination with light. So hopefully by building awareness, we can find a way to come back to our night. So that's it for this part of the presentation. I will also say I welcome you to come to my blog, Anatomy of Night, where I do a lot of writing and research on this topic. So there's a lot more information there. And so that's anatomyofnight.com. And then this is any resources that you may have wanted from the presentation. I can send that to you. Please feel free to email me. And thank you so much. Who has, does anyone have any questions or comments? And I have a question. I see yes. questions. Um, who's going first? Go ahead, Jimmy. Um, my question is, how do you adapt this to uh, uh, existing subdivisions that might be bordering on a wetland? I mean, would you change people's floodlights or is it the bulb that, they, that you change or is it the whole fixture? It would depend on the fixture. And um, it also depends on who, I mean, are these people's personal floodlights or are they, um, are they part of the municipal lighting? No, I mean like you're just like someone has a, uh, a floodlight in it for their backyard or, or on their walkway or something like that. I mean, or are you also talking about the light that's coming from inside the house? Should they be changing bulbs in the house or how would you adapt that? For the house, we, the, the house is gonna come last in this whole thing because we really need to create the awareness. <clears throat> but um, so in terms of people's floodlights, that's gonna be from the, from the model lighting ordinance that gets adopted in Wakefield or whatever Wakefield ends up wanting to do. Um, when you assess where you want your lighting to go, um, that's how you'll be able to regulate that. It's a very tricky thing with homeowners. So, because there's the whole, my home is my castle thing um, yeah. that can be regulated through an ordinance, um, but that's a more long-term game um, in terms of having the power as a municipality to make these decisions. Um, there are lighting controls which can be adapted into certain lighting fixtures and that will give you the power to make overarching decisions about um, how you want the, the look and feel of your town to be um, at certain times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jane, though, from your recommendations, you know, if, as homeowners, if we shut lights off by midnight and keep them off until, you know, sunrise, we're doing a good you know, thing on our part, correct? Absolutely, you warm my heart by saying that because I think people just don't know. They think, you know, turning, keeping the lights out, lights on at night, it's no big deal, um, except it is a big deal. It's just not an intuitive thought that yeah. it would create a disruption. A lot of us have our fixture set, you know, light on at uh, sundown, light back on at sunrise. I mean, right. light off at sunrise, you know, with the automatic yeah. light sensing fixtures. and. I think we've kind of not even thought about this. 
Yes. And uh, yeah, the, a lot of times, you know, people enjoy different colors of light, blue light, et cetera. You know, and I'm not trying to be a party pooper, you know, Christmas lights, all the holiday lighting. It's still possible. It just doesn't need to blare at 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. I do see some other hands raised. Uh, yes, I would like to say something, please. Sure, please. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Brahman Delavopian. I cannot tell you how thrilled and excited I am for this um, seminar. I have been trying to um, educate um, the Wakefield public for years about light pollution, years about light pollution. Um, everything from our town boards um, to our neighbors to getting a, um, a lighting bylaw in town. And so this is a wonderful first step because you legitimize this whole um, idea of light pollution. It, for many people, light pollution is not real. It doesn't apply to them. Um, it doesn't hurt anything. And no one's going to tell me what to do with my property. So there's a great deal of resistance. Um, uh, and, and I think one way to, to, to get people more interested and more interested in listening and learning is that it is true that, that light affects all of us, but, and it's wonderful that people understand that it, 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 it has deleterious effects on animals as well as plants, including, um, trees in our urban settings. Um, but when people understand that it affects them directly, you know, then they, they might sit up and, and, and um, take a little bit of uh, more attention. Uh, it is one of the easiest and least expensive pollutions to mitigate. Absolutely. You can retrofit very easily and in some cases for free. Um, Jim Luciani brought up the whole concept of spotlights, which are a bane to my existence. Um, we have street lights that are, I have to put my, my, my uh, visor down at night because they are, they're dangerous. They're dangerously bright. These things never, in my eyes, never should have happened in the first place. But once they're done, they're really hard to change and undo. So, um, so again, what the species people are most interested in is our own species. So when you're educating and you have outreach, if you can show people how this affects them directly and how easy mm -hmm. it is and how inexpensive it is to fix it. Um, that is, that, that is going to be the, uh, the best way to go about it. I believe uh, And you mentioned consensus, which is, is very important, but one of the most difficult for some of the reasons I just cited. Um, it really needs to, to start with town leadership. Uh, this has to be, on their radar, so to speak. And from, from town hall down to our committees that oversee developments um, and then moving on to our bylaws so that there's a, um, there are some guidelines and some teeth um, that, that guide people as to what they can and cannot do. So I'm particularly pleased um, to see some members of the planning board here. And I think I, think I saw a couple of people on the uh, zoning board of appeals. Um, so thank you so much. Um, it's lovely to hear uh, uh, this. And um, I think this is off people's radar because of our disconnect with nature. But, so thank you, I'm thrilled. Thank you so much. I will say that this presentation is deliberately geared towards plants and animals, simply because when I go to conferences, which are in the lighting industry, the big talk is human-centered lighting. So it's actually a departure from, from what is normally talked about in lighting industries uh, conferences. But it's a good point that when I'm, when I'm outside of the lighting industry that people want to hear again about the human-centered lighting. But I was sort of uh, trying to avoid it for that reason. But it's a, a nice point. So thank you, Bronwyn. I appreciate that. Oh, you're very welcome. Yes, and it affects human health. And, and that absolutely does. Yes, it absolutely does. Light pollution absolutely does affect hu human health in, in ways that uh, most people are not aware of. So uh, I, I always recommend that 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 be um, one of the main focal points when you're trying to educate people about uh, light pollution. Yeah, that's a very fair point.
Are there other questions uh, for Jane? I um, don't see any hands raised. Okay. Jimmy? No, I, 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 no, I don't have any other questions right now. Now, this is very informative. Um, you know, there are things that uh, I'm amazed that I've heard tonight um, that I just had no idea of. And I think one of the things we can definitely take away is we can all start with our own, you know, houses and yards. And as members of commissions and boards, you know, keep these things in mind, you know, down lighting and, and uh, hours of light and all of those types of suggestions that Jane has given us. This is Jennifer Kelly. Can I ask one question? Um, so recently I was driving on, I think it was 95, and actually there's brand new lighting uh, that went up in um, the off ramps, which are huge. They're extremely tall and they have, you know, they're like lighting pods. It's like a circle of lights. And I'm just wondering, since we live so close to some of these highways as well, where the, um, is this model lighting apply or could it be applied to that type of um, lighting as well? Absolutely. So essentially that model lighting ordinance, it's just a model for towns to take the language and start to work with an existing template. And that from there, they can start to design exactly how they want their lighting to be. So it's basically, you know, your um, dry run, and then you can start developing the language. It just, it gives you a starting place. So from there, you could absolutely, you know, if, if sometimes, and that's what the beauty of lighting controls is, is that previously in, in other eras, we would install lighting like that you're describing on 95 and it would be there for 30 years. If you install lighting controls in conjunction with that and you start to see that you're getting complaints, well, then you can actually change that with the lighting controls and then you never have to um, deal with the complaints. So you can solve the solution right there and it's not a 30 year problem or a dismantling of what you installed. And you can do it per your ordinance. So you can kind of hit it two ways. One side with the technology, which gives you some forgiveness of uh, any things that come up. And then the other side with the ordinance because you're really regulating what you want. Thank you. Yeah. I see another question from Bronwyn. Uh, yes, actually, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you, um, this committee, can uh, take this under your wing, this whole concept of light pollution. Um, and uh, I think you're the, you're the most uh, appropriate uh, committee to maybe start doing something with it on a regular basis, whether it's outreach, um, public education, uh, working with other boards, um, because now, now it's on your radar. And I, I feel that in a way it's, it's, it's some town committee's responsibility to to start working with it and not just let it go. I mean, things get let go so often, and this mm -hmm. is so important. Um, so, is there is there some way that, that this board could discuss that as to how to keep it on the radar and keep this moving forward, and, and perhaps develop um, a public education program? So, just a quick comment on that. Over the last few years, we actually have been working with developers and talking about directional lighting and how much light is being scattered you know, off the property and things of that nature. And the, you know, uh, developers uh, and their engineers have actually also been coming back with solutions and um, really preemptively coming up with ideas to us saying, you know, this directional lighting will not be casting outside the parking lot. It is casting downward. So they've been also coming to us with the, you know, uh, better ideas right up front. So we definitely have seen a shift in the last couple of years uh, towards that whole lighting situation. But is there a difference between, um, like they're usually talking about lumens, how many lumens they can get in a certain area. I, is Jane talking more about what type of light is being emitted? So with lumens, that's basically your intensity. So you have, you know, 
hundred lumens, a thousand lumens, you know, a really intense um, light could be 30,000 lumens. Yeah. So it's, it's basically your intensity. And then um, depending on the, on the light source you're specifying, it could have a different color to it. Um, so it's color and intensity that you really look at in terms of light. Right, so we should be after warmer, softer lighting, directional downward lighting, and limiting the hours of lighting, you know, from midnight to 6 a.m. Yes, love it. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Is there federal or government regulations or resources that are related to light pollution? Nothing on a federal level. Paul Meller and I, we've talked about that, that we, we would love for something to come from the top down, but at this point it's not, there, it's not regulated in a, um, in a federal way. Um, what I will say is that you have organizations like the International Dark Sky Association and the IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, they had come up with the model lighting ordinance. They also recently just came out with a top five list of things to do for um, lighting exteriors environmentally. Um, so that you can look up that five uh, um, recommendation. I can try and find it and put it in the chat. Um, but there is a recommendation. But at this point, um, and, and this just gives you an idea of how early we are, that there are not, it's just the awareness is not there. So it's such a pleasure for me to deliver this information to a group like yourselves, because it helps to create awareness, but there's, there's no regulation on it. It's just up to towns to develop. So there's nothing that comes from the federal level because it's just the, the awareness has not been created yet. Because I'm assuming this also, there's a cost associated if you want to retrofit lighting of old structure. So in, in other words, you're going to comp you could also compromise security in a way if you're no. going to, no? I'm sorry, what were you saying, Bob? Can I step in, Jane? Yes, please do, Paul. I, I work with Jane. Yeah. Um, as you travel throughout New England, yeah. um, every city and town is unique. Many of the large cities, um, they're more worried about the animals that are doing a drive-by the next street over. So if you put a uniform constraint across the board on every city, you know, what's good for one town may not be good for another. Every city is unique. You got to look at the individual applications. You know, I'm from Wakefield. I drive around the lake and I look at Jordan's furniture and I wonder what they do to lake water power. As far yeah. as the animals, that would be an excellent thing for a control to dim it down at night a little bit. Yeah. As you drive around the lake, you look towards Route 95, you can see the sky glow from those high mass poles. Those should be dimmed down. Okay. You know, once the traffic dies down, bring the light levels down. Yeah. But every everything is unique. You know, if you live in a side street, a certain it's different from downtown Main Street. And with regard to safety, uh, absolutely, we want to make sure that we're lighting for human safety. Uh, the thing is, is that people associate more light with safety, and that's not necessarily true. Enough light creates safety, but when you actually add more light than is needed, you can create glare um, and spots for predators to hide in, spots for things to, for obstacles to be out of view. So um, that's why you want to have the lighting experts on your side to make sure that you're designing lighting that actually works and isn't creating those hot spots. Okay. I do see another hand raised, Jay. Yes. Go ahead, Ed. Oh, okay. Hi, Jane. Uh, first off, thank you for this presentation. Incredibly informative. Um, question for you. It seems like, um, once a lot of lights were converted to LED street lights or, or the like, it seemed like there, there was this real trend to go brighter and brighter. Um, even, you know, gooseneck lights for, for storefront signage or any kind of, you know, um, lighting within windows of stores has just gone so incredibly bright. What was the impetus behind that? Is it just that at the time the LEDs were just brighter and they've, they've become more sophisticated or, or 
you know, why, why is that? Great question. Okay, so LEDs are super tiny and they're super efficient. Uh, and so, and they're super bright. They're, we have these things called chip on board modules and it's this little tiny chip and you could get a retinal burn by staring at one of those things. So essentially the technology is so amazing that it has no parameters anymore. There's no parameter of electric bills. So it's really cheap to run them. They're tiny and they can be held up with a sticker. So it's super easy to illuminate with LEDs and that's partly why everything got brighter. But then there's also some very common misconceptions which is that brighter is safer and brighter is better. And that's not really true because there's this whole hidden side of it, which I've talked about tonight, which is the impact that light at night has that is not intuitive as a human. So it's just all too easy with LEDs because of their technological power. And, um, and then it's also, they're very alluring, but it's, but the, we are going to have to really educate to bring that balance back and also use ordinances so that, you know, when uh, Joe's liquor store comes in and wants to get those goosenecks on their, their facade, that they have to be reeled in by some sort of regulation. Thank you. Yeah. I'm still not a little clear on the color of the light that's transmitted and how that how that happens. Is it a special fixture that you're doing this with or, or is it a special bulb? Okay. Both. Great question. Okay. So when you have an incandescent bulb and it doesn't remember the tungsten that was there. Mm -hmm. So that actually operated very similar to what, the way the sun did, which was burning a black body, in this case, tungsten. Mm -hmm. And so it, it revealed a very similar light to sunlight. And so we always refer to incandescent as being um, a very near to the quality of sunlight. When we went to LEDs, it's a completely different technology. And um, in 2014, Shuji Nakamura won the Nobel Prize for the blue LED. And that is in what is in most lighting fixtures. It's actually a blue LED that they cover with phosphor to make it white. So you actually have a lot of hidden blue light in there and it's not the <clears throat> spectrum. So if you look at the color of light in an, in an uh, LED, it's actually got red and then it's missing yellow and then it's got orange and then it's missing green. And so it's actually not full spectrum. So there's actually, you know how we talk about the rainbow of light, white light has all the colors in it. Yeah, right. Well, we can get, LEDs to look very white, but there may not be all the colors in it. And it may actually have a lot of triggering blue in it, which can be really bad for wildlife. So that's why incandescent, and then you had other sources like high pressure sodium, which was not like incandescent. It was very yellow. It was very narrow in like the orangish band mm -hmm. of color. Does that help clarify your question? Yes, yes it does. Okay, good. You know, Jane, those first LEDs were very blue and very expensive. And now you can purchase soft, um, you know, soft light LEDs, which are much more, you know, closely resembling uh, incandescent bulbs. Yes. And so that was originally because when we first got LEDs, they were expensive, but they were so efficient. Mm -hmm. And when you put phosphor on the blue, you actually make it less efficient. So the whole thing was, well, it's all about efficiency. But I always say, it's like, if you go to a buffet and you eat two plates of food when you only needed one, it's wasteful. So mm -hmm. if, it's, if you're being so efficient that you are illuminating with more light than you need, it's still wasteful. So actually it's just choose the color you want. We have more than enough light at this point. So is the, is the, um... The temperature of the of the light reflect on what colors are in the light. Okay, I think Jim, I have the missing piece of information for you. Okay, so this is a term in lighting. It's called CCT or correlated color temperature. And so essentially, if you put a log, which is a black body, a carbon body, in the fire, well, 
the, the orange embers at the bottom, that color orange is always the same temperature. It's about a thousand degrees Kelvin. Okay. So we correlate light to the color of the black body when it's burning. So the white flame coming off of the log is 2,700 degrees Kelvin. That's what we equate to being residential lighting. Okay. 3,000 K is a little bit bluer. 5,000 K is that blue flame. Is that how? Okay. That, uh, that's exactly what I needed to know. I thought Thank so, you. okay, yeah. I think the th another thing is that um, this is great for planning and in, in, in the future and when you're going to go change your, your, your lighting. Um, but I don't want to lose the fact that there are a lot of things that can be done easily and in many cases free um, to mitigate lighting. Now, it, some, some towns have actually gone up and painted the inside of the globe of their streetlights that face the homes. And that mm -hmm. is sufficient to block the street light from uh, trespassing um, uh, onto the property and into homes. And at the same time, um, illuminating the street and so that they don't have to go change the, 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 the bulbs or the actual um, uh, fixtures. So, I mean, there are sort of, uh, you know, uh, down and dirty, easy fixes that people can do. And I don't want to lose sight of that because there are a lot of mitigating things that can be done with current lighting, shielding, um, all sorts of things that can be done right now um, um, before the next um, uh, stream of, of lights or light bulbs and light color um, mm -hmm. is, is, uh, selected by a town or a community. Okay. I often talk about complexity being a barrier to good design. Um, and especially when I talk about birds, oftentimes it's of only a few windows in a town that are really the culprits because birds have their own flight paths just like planes do. So you can order a simple decal on Amazon and put it on that window. Um, and, and decrease bird death that way. So I agree, Bronwyn, that there are sometimes some very simple moves to make big improvements. Jen Kelly again, I just wanted to raise, I know this isn't exactly the topic of your conversation, but there's been an explosion in exterior mounted LC, LCD TVs as well, um, large ones, which is another source of light pollution, noise pollution and all of that. There's actually a sign ordinance um, for that. And the IES did produce it, the Illuminating Engineering Society on sign lighting. And it is, um, it's a tricky business because there's a, it's, there's a lot of big money behind those sign companies. So um, agreed that that is a big source of light pollution. And that's definitely not this domain. I don't work in that domain. I just happen to know about it, but it is definitely another side of the lighting industry that will require more regulation. Okay. One more thing I just wanted to raise. I was looking at um, the Massachusetts State House, and it looks like there are bills actually um, uh, that received some action as early or as recently as like April of this year. Yes. So what, what you're saying is none of these have been adopted, but it looks like there's a, been a number of them proposed recently. Yes. So Senator Cream, she's in uh, the Newton area. Um, I was recently on an IDA, International Dark Sky Association, chapter meeting. Um, and she was um, part of that meeting. And so uh, she's working on it. I know that it's not gonna get past this year that there's whatever legislative process they're going through, it's not gonna happen. Um, but that it is, it will happen I, because I believe it will happen. Um, but there's legislation coming down the pike because there's a, a growing movement for it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, so I, yeah, that's my update on it. And that's as of uh, early October. Okay. 
Are there any other questions for Jane? Sure, I'll think of some later. Well, I'm putting my email and Paul's email. Um, we have a Wakefield office, uh, so please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, Jane. And Thank Ann you Paul. so much. And Paul. Thank you. This has been very informative and certainly given us a lot of things to think about um, for future projects and around our own personal lives. Yes, I think awareness, honestly, no one wants this. We just don't know. And if we do the word out, we can make a lot of really great improvements. I put that list of the IES IDA new collaboration right above my email address. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank yes, you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right, uh, from the uh, commission, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything like to uh, discuss? Yes, okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second, I guess no one else is. <laughs> Okay, polling individually. Silvana. I have the woman. I have my word. I'm like, did you see him? Yeah, I did. Oh, Silvana's yeah. muted. Uh, Sorry, my dogs were barking. Okay. <laughs> do you move? Do you yes. vote to uh, adjourn? Yes. Ken. Teresa. Yes. Peter. Yes. Jimmy. Yes. And I also vote yes to adjourn. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night. And we'll see you next uh, next Thursday. Is that right? Judy, thank you for coordinating this. Yeah, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really informative. Yeah, I want to try to put together more in the future that you know, multi board topics. You know, I think that's important because there's no really no collaboration right now amongst the boards. So things like this can, especially with bigger projects coming up, I think no, it would be helpful. It was good I to agree. see uh, other I yeah, agree with that. people hopping on. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it suggests that our maybe our role is larger than just the Wetlands Protection Act, you know, that we should have a maybe a larger view of what we could contribute. It would be, it would be ultra viewers, of course, but that's okay, Peter. Pardon me? It's not a, it'd be outside our jurisdiction, but, but so what? That, that's my point. <laughs> exactly. Precisely. <laughs> but, but there are potential yeah. wetlands. Just our, our legislative mandate, well, that's just a, so a suggestion. <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> but there are wetlands implications, right? With yeah, no, no, definitely. Wetlands. There are, no, there are, no, there are. No, no, no. There are definitely wetlands implications. Um, absolutely. So, I mean, that is our jurisdiction. Oh, that is, absolutely. We cannot be the um, light police for every subdivision, but uh, we certainly right. can have an impact right. on any uh, jurisdictional project. Absolutely. In our own, you know, houses and yards, obviously. Yeah. If I can only get my kids to, uh, you know, be uh, light conscious. <laughs> I shut off, like, shut off the light when they leave the room. Huh? I, I constantly do that. <laughs> yes. Well, that all was right, so, uh, that's good. Yeah, so we did uh, all vote to adjourn. So I am going to end the meeting. Uh, and good night. We'll see everybody in two weeks. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.